between the moderate and aggressive growth is probably we're gonna, where we're going to end up. So that by 2050, the year 2050, we're going to be at a point where the world's population will be double what it is today. So it'll be close to 10 billion people. By 2030 in India, the population is expected to be about 1.5, 1.6 billion. And by 2050, 2 billion people in the world. 2 billion people in India. Today, where there's 1.15 billion people. Now, that's a challenge. Now, we fear that. The world fears it. I want to put it into some sort of perspective. Here's a map of India. The 10 most populous Indian states today have about as many inhabitants as these countries all over the world. And the 18 remaining states have the same population as the United States, 300 million. Now, that's a remarkable situation to face. It's a great challenge. As well, the challenge of prosperity has accommodated that. Now, India has br brought more people out of poverty than any other country in the world. India today, from 1981 to today, the percentage of poor in India have dropped from 60% to just 42%. Since that time, nearly 580 million people were taken out of poverty here. That's almost twice the population of the United States, which is a remarkable change. It's meant tremendous growth for India, tremendous growth for its population. It is the leader in the world in farm output. Now, the challenge is, is that because of that prosperity, India still can barely produce enough grain to keep up with its current population. And grain and rice production will not exceed this rate going forward unless change occurs, which means we won't be able to feed the people of India in the future without significant change. Now, that significant change is coming. We heard $1 trillion in infrastructure construction. And remember, it's all integrated. So what does that mean? It means that when we talk about farm yield and output, we all think about the farmer working in the fields, producing more, learning more sophisticated methods to increase the yield in the field. But the fact is, one of the leasing causes for reduced output in agriculture is the lack of good highways in India to move produce to refrigerated areas that can maintain and take care of the product. So we need refrigerated warehouses, we need infrastructure, roads, we need transports, highways that will be able to take and move the product to the larger cities as well as to the refrigerated storage depots. This is about integration and the challenges. And globally, if we continue to move people into a more prosperous world at the rate that we've been going, by the year 2050, we'll need two planet Earths more than what we have now. Now, I'm not sure. I've looked up in the sky many, many times, and I thought, where are those other two planets? Well, in, 19, in early 1900s, when the US President Theodore Roosevelt created the national park system, he said, our responsibility is to be caretakers of future generations. And what we have to do is not give them a place that is as good as we have now, we have to add value to it and give it back so that our children and our grandchildren take care and receive a planet that is in better condition than when it was to begin with. Now, clearly, our lives are in better condition than we ever were. All of us working on every single project conceivable, when we work on IT projects, healthcare, um, municipal transportation systems, uh, airports, you name it. We are improving the quality of the way we live. But are we improving and adding value back into the world so that our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will have a place that is far better than we had when we inherited it? Much the same way my parents felt when they came from Italy 
They had nothing. They were poor. They were migrant and they were basically sharecroppers in Italy. And they came over and they said, the one thing I'm going to make sure is I am going to give an education to my children. My brother and I both had the opportunity to attend university. Well, what we have to think about is, what is that one thing we're going to give back that's going to add value to the lives of our children and grandchildren in the future? What is that one thing that we, as ordinary people, are going to do that's extraordinary in the future? Now, sometimes this is very hard to accept, and I don't mean to spend a lot of time, but I want to show two more points, because this is the good news and the bad news in India. I have these slides in any country in the world. So I'm not picking on India, I'm using them to show as an example. These are courtesy of the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation in India. That's what's happened to the trend of cost overrun versus the original cost of a project since 1985. That's a pretty good sign. Now you don't have to read the numbers to see that the curve is going in the right direction. These are the kind of curves everybody wants to see. Cost reduction, good thing. It's now 15% approximately of the projects are still cost overrun compared to over 60% when they began tracking it. That's a remarkable improvement. And as caretakers of resources, this is a remarkable thing to be excited about. However, when we look at the scheduling, and I don't have to, you don't have to see the numbers to realize that between 1999 and now, the numbers are almost identical. The projects are becoming bigger, more complex, and scheduling is becoming an increasing difficulty in order to meet the schedules. Now, if we put this in the context of money and, and the cost of money, we talk about foreign direct investment or pri public-private partnerships to accommodate and build this $1 trillion worth of construction. And we think about attracting the money from the private sector and attracting the foreign direct investment. How easy it is, is it to attract it when we say that 50% of the projects that we undertake will not meet the schedule? We'll do the budget. We'll get it done on budget. But we'll tie up your money for 20, 30, 40% longer than planned. It becomes more difficult to do it. Our value as project managers only goes up the better we are at managing that schedule. We're doing a great job with cost overruns. Now we have to focus our attention on scheduling. So all of this makes me, when I put my feet on the ground, feeling a little bit queasy about going out and talking about things. I try to think about today and tomorrow and the next five years, but it's hard for me to not think about the year 2050 when the population of the planet is doubled because it was just 40 years ago that I graduated from college. And I don't know about you, but when I wake up in the morning, I think it was just yesterday, until I look in the mirror and then I realize I, something's happened to me since that time. So when I think about this, I can get despondent and fall into despair about it. Well, I have a friend, uh, a very close friend by the name, I'll just use his first name. His name is George. And uh, he went through a very difficult time in his life. He really suffered uh, for a period of time in his life. And he had another close friend, mutual friend of ours, who he talked to on a frequent basis. And after a period of time, all George talked about was the problem he was having. And I, I don't know about you, whenever I get like that, I get into a very small package. It's hard to look outside of myself. I find out that, you know, I really don't care about anybody else. It's all about me and my problem. And this friend of ours finally turned to him and said, George, what you need to do is stop this. This is madness. Tomorrow I want you to wake up and walk around and try to find out what hope looks like, what it seems like to you. See it around you. And then in a couple of days come back and talk to me and tell me what hope looks like. Well, it was remarkable because it transformed him. George began to look around him and realize that there were things all over the world, all over his current life and way of life, people that were struggling just as hard as he was, but making great progress and transforming themselves. And again, it was about transformation. 
moving away from a state that was frightening and sometimes crippling and paralyzing to a state that empowered themselves to do more and to change. And so, as I get through this presentation, I want to talk to you a little bit about what hope looks like in my mind, especially when it comes to our profession. Probably one of the first things that comes to mind is the great courage and creativity of a woman who was a farmer in Kaladera in Rajasthan who challenged Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola was putting in a bottling plan and they predicted a $1 billion USD market for the sale of Coca-Cola. Now I drink Coca-Cola a lot. I spent 20 years in Atlanta, Georgia, the home of Coca-Cola. I love Coca-Cola products. But this farmer, uneducated farmer, challenged Coca-Cola and said, you're using too much water and we don't have water. The surrounding 15 surrounding farmers are suffering because of the water that you're using. And after uniting the farmers and gaining a lot of publicity about it, they challenged Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola brought in an independent consultant. And the consultant looked at it and said, well, at the current time, you're utilizing about seven and a half liters of water per liter of product produced. So for every liter of Diet Coke, seven and a half liters of water. And they said, look, we're going to bring somebody in and help improve our bottling operations. And they did. And they improved their bottling operations to the point where they were only using three and a half liters of water for every liter of product. And they said, that's not good enough, because you're asking us to produce the sugar cane, the sweeteners for these products, and we cannot produce them. So they took another analysis. And what they found was that for every liter of product, if you looked at the entire life cycle, it required 250 liters of water. Tragically, every bottle of water on this table takes three liters of water to produce, which is almost the perfect definition of unsustainability. Now, we drink the water, obviously it's great. We have tap water here that is, is fine to drink in this hotel, but we use a lot of bottled water. Now, what it's done to Coca-Cola is force Coca-Cola to move away from being an avid consumer of water to recognize that water is a lifeblood to their products in the future. And as a citizen of this planet, they have to change and alter their manufacturing strategy and their business strategy. They've become a proponent of watershed management. Atul Singh, who is the president of Coca-Cola India, said that by the year, the end of 2009, early 2010, they were to become water neutral, and they are water neutral in India. And they've also initiated a global collaborative under USAID called the um, Water and Development Alliance to provide better management of water. Now, you can bet that every one of the project managers working for Coca-Cola Coca now are required to be monitoring and police men and women to ensure that water is neutralized in the process rather than consumed and not given back. It, it has become a way of life for those project managers and part of their risk analysis whenever doing a new site study for Coca-Cola for a new bottling plant. Now for India, this is a great test because India suffers from watershed management. And that picture on the right the upper right of the child pumping water. The issue of clean, fresh water for India is a challenge going for forward. And the melting of the Himalayan glaciers is a challenge if climate change continues to grow. So that means in all of the operations in India going forward, in every manufacturing application, we as project managers need to become caretakers, not only of the money and the resources that are given to us, by the company, but also begin thinking about the precious assets that we have on the planet and how the country is going to grapple with a doubled population in 20 years and water with limited capacity 
to provide clean drinking water and water for, irrig for irrigation, for agriculture. But many companies around the world are actually challenging themselves and of this. Now part of the massive change for India will be the increase in the amount of electrical generating power for India. And it's pretty remarkable. Now, I looked at five of the major mega projects for energy in India. Very few are going to be hydroelectric because of the limited water capabilities. So they're going to be produced by solar, wind, coal, or carbon-based, other carbon-based fuels. Four of the five are coal-fired. And that's a challenge in and of itself, but it's necessary to give India the power that it needs. And many of you, if I asked you, probably could raise your hand and say, I'm working on that hydro, on that uh, coal generating, electric generating coal plant, or I'm working on that refinery project, or I'm working on the pipeline project. Well, Walmart, which is the largest company in the world and the largest department store in the world, decided privately that it has to do something about the amount of carbon being released into the atmosphere. And it began to work with all of the suppliers. Now bear in mind, Walmart, being the largest department store in the world, has 60,000 suppliers. And it brought together the major suppliers and it says, we have to do something together. We have to take the initiative. Now what they did when they took the initiative is those 60,000 suppliers are now going to be required to measure the amount of carbon that they put into the atmosphere and put it on the product itself before it ever gets on the shelf at a Walmart. Not only that, within five years, they'll limit the amount of carbon that each project, product category can produce. If you exceed it, you won't be able to put your product on the shelf. And that's pretty remarkable. Now, Procter & Gamble, who is a member of our executive council, the person who's the lead project manager for their global distribution of products, said it's revolutionizing the way their project managers work with products going forward. So carbon is a big issue. Now, coal-fired fire, uh, power plants produce carbon, but there is also hope in the way energy is going to be produced. The project management Project of the Year award winner was the National Ignition Facility in the United States. It's probably one of the most sophisticated and leading edge uh, production of energy that I've ever seen. Literally, with the flip of a switch in March of 2010, we went from science fiction to science fact. They have a program called Laser Induced Fusion Energy. It's a magnificent program. Unlike the fission energy that we've been so accustomed to, fusion energy is far more efficient and doesn't generate any waste in the form of um, what we call dirty fuel rods that have to be buried. In fact, they have a form uh, called a uh, fusion blanket where they can transform dirty fuel and consume it in the energy process and eliminate energy waste. And they project that in 20 years, they'll be able to produce nuclear reactors that will be clean, carbon-free, and generating power far more uh, efficient than any nuclear power plant in the world today. Now, that's pretty remarkable. In fact, they showed me the plant. The plant is now sitting inside a building that is about 140 meters long, six stories high, and about 50 meters wide. They showed me the plant that they can produce within the next 20 years. It's 10 meters long, 3 meters wide, and 3 meters high. And that will be the nuclear power plant that will generate the kind of energy that is necessary to the tune of 3 gigawatts of power. Now that's pretty remarkable. Another wonderful example of positive change. The Panama Canal expansion. This is an expansion. It's a, an expansion taking place now. It was commissioned in 2006. And actually the first shovel of dirt was turned over in 2007. Its projection is to double the capacity of the Panama Canal 
by the year 2014, 100 years to the day after the original Panama Canal was opened. Now this is remarkable because the Panama Canal expansion is being built in a way that no one has ever done on the planet before. Instead of using um, live water flowing through, the hydrology of the balance between the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, it uses a giant reservoir of water. And what that does is protect the fish life and the environment. So when a ship comes through, they pump the water into the canal. When the ship leaves, they pump it back out. And they protect it. And they protect the hydrology of the entire area. They've also reclaimed the largest amount of land previously destroyed by the um, uh, Panama Canal, and it's the largest land reclamation in all of Central America. But what's interesting about it is when they began the project and the Panama Canal Authority went and hired CH2M Hill to help them with the project, no one had ever heard about things called risk management. No one had ever heard of the term earn value management. And the 19 major contractors that they do, used had never heard of that. And they were the largest contractors in northern South America and Central America. Well, that was unsatisfactory to the Panama Canal Authority. They said, we have to train them. It's our responsibility. They have to tra be trained so that we can do effective risk management and we can do uh, good earned value management and measurements so that we can track it on a scorecard. Today, all 19 major contractors and all the subcontractors associated with that project are now fluent in project management capabilities. So not only has the project itself, which represents 24% of their gross domestic product, not only is that project environmentally sensitive, and improved and technologically advanced from any other canal built in the world today, they have raised the capability of the profession in Central America. And it's interesting because they have a, a minister in Panama called a Minister of Innovation. And when I first met him, I was a little skeptical about what that meant. But he had a strategy. And that strategy was to create innovation centers and logistics management in that country. Georgia Tech just started their first innovation center for logistics management for the entire Latin American community in Panama. They believed that innovation, as they said, was not only the idea, the imagination, the creativity, but it's the ability to bring that project to life on time, on budget, and within the scope that they said to begin with. And they're doing it. A tiny little country, Panama, changing the face of Latin America, creating a world-class application that they can pre be proud of. Because they were concerned not only of the technological advance, but the human capacity, the ability to raise the quality and capability of the people, just like India has done by raising more people out of poverty than anywhere else in the world. Now the Mangalore refinery here in India is an example. It was well behind schedule, which is always a challenge. 15 months, it was projected to be 15 months behind schedule. That could have been accepted as it was, but instead there was a need to continue to work on the project. And as such, they, they changed the process to design to improve the yield and the quality of the diesel fuel coming out. And they also used different pro propylene units in the last phase of the program to increase the yield and cut the costs. And it was human capacity, the human capacity to go in and take advantage of a schedule delay that not only increased the quality and value of the product, but also cut the overall cost, which is what's continued to in to drive that curve down in India that showed cost reductions long term. So these are things of hope about this planet, about the way we work as ordinary people doing or extraordinary things. Now, I don't know how many of you saw this picture before. I was, um, it was 1970, 
I was just graduating from university. Let me back that up. Now it goes on its own. That's pretty good. Can we move that? There you go. I saw this for the first time. It's called Earthrise, and it was shot by an Apollo crew that was on the moon at the time. It was the first time the Earth was photographed from another planet. And it was startling, because the Earth was so simple, a blue wall in the sky. Now, in all the millions and millions and millions of stars and galaxies surrounding those stars, no one has yet to find a planet that could sustain life like Earth does. It's a very fragile environment. And we have to be careful about it. Now, I, I can tell you that we have our challenges ahead. The population of the world will double. Will we have climate change? I'm not a climate scientist. My guess is yes, we will. We have to. Will we run out of oil? We already have. Oil is no longer on the surface. We have to struggle to get it. Are we producing agriculture in a sufficient amount to feed the people we have today? No, not on this planet. There's still people all over the world that need it. But because of ordinary people like yourselves doing extraordinary things, all of you, there is great hope for us, for the planet, and for the environment. In this next 20 years, as India begins to build the infrastructure that's necessary to achieve greatness, to move up to the fifth largest consumer of products in the world, to bring more people out of poverty than any other place in the world, to become the third or fourth leading economy in the world. It must first consider the environment that we have and the precious assets we have. And each of you can do that. And will be required to do that as project program and portfolio managers. It's no longer an option. You will have the demand on your shoulders to be the caretakers of tomorrow. To add value back into the environment, not just to produce a product. My goodness, you, nearly a million, cell phone, uh, a million cell phones a month are, are distributed in India. And I'm sure that there's a few people who, just like me, after about six months, you're thinking, you know, I'd like to get that new cell phone that just came out. How do we recycle those? Should we be recycling phones? You bet. Nokia and Ericsson both are working on recyclable phones that are made from 99% recycled materials. And the project managers on those teams are being challenged with technology they've never seen before. But I have hope because you, as ordinary people, can accomplish extraordinary things. You have no choice, but that's OK. Because of your greatness, because of what you have done with this country so far, what you will do tomorrow, and what you will do over the next 40 years. And for that, as I look back over the last 40 years, and in particular the last eight years, I feel honored and privileged and humbled by what I've learned, touched in a way that I cannot change ever again. And so as I stepped down as the CEO of PMI, I stepped down feeling in my life that I have done something worthwhile. That something is to be associated with people like you. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I hope that you continue doing those things. I know you can. I believe that you can. Because the world needs you and needs what you do. When you go home tonight, just before you go to sleep, think of one thing. What would have happened if, for the last 40 years, project management would have not matured at all? That we would be the same as we were 40 years ago in the way we manage projects. Now, that's not a very pretty picture, but ask yourself the second thing, and that'll help you think about it. Who really improved those projects? Was it computers? Was it technology? Was it monitors? Was it processes? It was people like you. With that, I wish you all the greatest of success and an absolutely great Congress here this year for our second National Congress in India. Thank you very much.